this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over 2 billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Again today I sit here before the computer screen connected with the technical help of the Skype program with my brother in Christ Tom Fress from Inquisition Update from the United States of America who is joining me today for the 49th time in the reading and discussion and analysis of the book of Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusions. Hello Tom. Welcome to Hello. the podcast. Hello, Yerk. I'm, I'm pleased and blessed to be here and uh, to speak to you and uh, and the listeners about Steve Wahlberg's book. It's uh, it's a slam dunk. I really appreciate Steve Wahlberg for taking the time and trouble to write this book. As I said one one other time, you know, I've been asked uh, uh, mo uh, many times, you know, Tom, why, why don't you write a book? And, uh, you know, this this book is one of the reasons why I don't write one. I would simply be reinventing the wheel. And Steve Wolberg has done an, a woman's job of uh, of uh, proving futurism uh, to be wrong. And then historicism is the correct school of Bible prophecy interpretation. If I, by the way, I'm reminded by a previous program that you did today. Uh, one of the comments of a, one of the listeners, I won't name him, I don't want to embarrass him, but he didn't obviously know what futurism is. And uh, I want your listeners, if they don't know by now, they ought to know what futurism is. Futurism is that school of Bible prophecy interpretation that says, that the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, known as the 70 weeks of Daniel, that the 70th and final week of that prophecy, the last seven years of that 490-year prophecy, is detached from the 69th week of years, or, or 483 years, and then 
skips over 2,000 years of church history and doesn't uh, begin to be fulfilled until the very end of time, just before Christ's return. That somehow God stops the prophetic clock at the end of the 69th or the 483rd year of that prophecy and doesn't finish the last seven years, the final week of that prophecy, until the end of time. Completely skipping over the entire church age. The prophecy essentially comes to a screeching halt in Jerusalem at the time of the end of the 69th week, and it doesn't begin until the end of time, also again in Jerusalem, and one seven-year period of time they call the Great Tribulation. They call it the seven years of Great Tribulation. And, of course, before the uh, man of sin is revealed or, or, or uh, uh, comes upon the world scene, uh, futurists believe they're all going to be raptured out. They'll never see wrath. They'll never see uh, persecution of the Antichrist and uh, that God will spare them all, despite the fact that the Scripture plainly says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It also is ignorant of the fact of the last 2,000 years, which futurism just simply skips over, has been the persecution of the saints. Multitudes, hundreds of millions of Bible-believing, God-fearing people have been persecuted and disemboweled and torn asunder and sawn asunder and burned at the stake, had their property and their children taken from them, every kind of torture on the rack, being pulled in two by horses, being, being burned at the stake, every kind of hideous torture there ever was devised by the wicked man of sin, the papacy. And why did they die? Why did they suffer? Why is the earth soaked with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus? Why? Because they proclaimed the papacy for 2,000 years. They proclaimed the papacy to be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the little horn of Daniel, the antichrist, the son of perdition, the lawless one, the counterfeit Christ, the Judas priest. That has been the preoccupation of God's people for 2,000 years. And they paid with their property. They paid with their babies. They paid with their treasure. They, pay, they, pray, they, they paid with their future. They paid with their own blood, their own bowels, their own guts for 2,000 years slaughtered like cattle. The land is literally fertilized with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. But they've all been forgotten. The righteous have perished and no one takes it to heart anymore. Why? Well, because we no longer believe that the man of sin is the Pope. We don't care what the Pope's history is, and we certainly doubt that he's the Antichrist, because the Antichrist hasn't come upon the world scene yet. He's a future entity, not a dynasty of popes that have dominated and persecuted the saints of the Most High for 2,000 years. No, he's a single individual that doesn't come till just before Jesus returns. And he's only going to last for three and a half or seven years. He's going to deceive the whole world. He's going to persecute the saints of the Most High. He's going to cause a temple to be built in Jerusalem so the Jews can resume animal sacrifices and eat and drink damnation to themselves. See, that's what futurism is. It's taught in all the churches, and everybody believes it, including the heckler on, on, on uh, Yerk's previous program today whom I assailed as a futurist. And we've heard enough, quite enough, from the futurists in the churches. 
It's time for historicism to be preached. It's time for future or for historicism to be exhumed from the grave to enlighten God's people to return us to the heart of our Savior and to restore the dignity of all the slain of the earth who the papacy has slain as though he were the champion of God. No more futurism spoken here. Historicism is the correct school of Bible prophecy interpretation. It accounts for the entire 2,000 year history as recorded in prophecy in the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ encompasses the last 2,000 years of church history. No period of Christian church history has been left un, uh, 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 uncovered by the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a living history book. Prophecy is simply history foretold. It, it foretells the entire church age. It foretells the ruling of the Antichrist all throughout the church age. Historicism is the only school of Bible prophecy interpretation that's worthy of mention. And it's the only one that ever was mentioned in the body of Christ up until about 200 years ago. And what damage has been done in the last 200 years? What deception? Even so much so that it would deceive the very elect. It certainly did deceive the heckler from the, from the, from the first program that you're CAD today. Well, we're not going to tolerate that kind of nonsense anymore. The truth needs to be heard. And we don't need to be shouted down by futurists who can't let go of their futurist delusions. Sorry to be so frank, but that's just the way the truth is. It can't be taken hostage. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. You are making a point of what the broadcast today is all about in Chapter 20 that we are about to read. Um, I just want to say that man that um, gave these comments in the video there, um, the strange thing about him is that he um, claims that he has read the book of James Edgar Wiley, The Antichrist, a demonstration, and um, then he says uh, that there will be one final Antichrist which will be uh, Satan's uh, fleshly, uh, how, how, how did he say that, um, how, how do you put that, uh, Satan in the flesh, yeah, that will be the last Antichrist. Oh. The problem is well, that he doesn't understand that every Pope is exactly that. That's right. Um, that's right. And, and uh, I, I don't get how someone is uh, promoting to you and to me reading books of James Edgar Wiley, where we have read J books of James Edgar Wiley, where he probably has never even heard of. So I, I don't like to be lectured from people who have no understanding at all. And that man didn't have any, any understanding at all. I didn't block him from my channel. I don't think it's even worse that I think maybe when he gets a chance to come back, he maybe sees through the deception that he is in. I have no other way of doing it, but I just don't... Uh, uh, write those people anymore. I wrote one comment after he made numerous comments and I just said, well, that's where I leave it. I don't have anything else to say and that's it. Um, those people I then leave to their own studies. That's the only thing that will convince them anyway. And I think uh, that is what we are going to, to do here with the reading of Steve Wahlberg's book, uh, that we are trying to convince people to do their own studies and by their own studies and own reading come to the conclusions uh, that the Holy Spirit leads them to, not what we lead them to. I mean, Tom and, and I, we can never lead anyone to the truth because we are fallible men. We are wretched sinners, like all of you. But the teaching that we give through the reading of these books is uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can lead you into all truths. Not we. We are only used by the Holy Spirit as the vessels, let's say, uh, as, as, as the spoken 
uh, as the spoken word that that he puts out that then you make your own choice of the you 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 have to study uh, this book of end time delusions for yourself you have to study the bible for yourself and you have to come to your own understanding of that by your own study i think that is very very important and nobody knows that better than tom and me because where we are today is only where we gotten because we have studied years and years and especially tom probably almost all his life reading old protestant and historicist books and by that forming the understanding that historicism is the only val uh, valuable and valuable interpretation of prophecy in the bible there is no other way everything else is out of the bible and when anything is out of the bible and measured at the bible um, does not hold up like futurism does like preterism does then it is false and the only thing remaining is historicism and interesting with tom's comment was today of course that he exactly addresses what we are speaking today about in the new chapter because on this 49th uh, reading we are approaching a new chapter which is called the path of the virus and we are not speaking of the virus that uh, engulfs the world since uh, 2020 and um, is in everyone's uh, mind and in everyone's mouth for these days we are speaking of the virus of futurism the virus that infiltrated bible teaching bible preaching because actually you are supposed to go to a congregation where you have like-minded people this ecclesia this meeting is called a church and in that church it needs to be taught the truth from the bible but there's no church quote unquote church out there where you find that because that virus of futurism has infiltrated as tom said so valuable many times uh, from the beginning of the of the 19th century and this is exactly what this chapter is all about so all these things that tom already scratched on or mentioned a little bit more deeply are coming now that we are speak about in this chapter 20. after this chapter 20 there comes another chapter that is 21 this is altogether 15 pages and then we come into the last part of the book which is the most valuable as well for tom as for me which was published uh, earlier by the author as a separate book called the israel deception exploded and that is going to be where it all culminates to that is what it actually is all about so stay with us for the next 15 pages and then we come to the wonderful climax uh, the um uh, there's another the epitome of this work of this book exploding the israel deception but before that we have now chapter 20 the path of the virus a man i didn't uh, I, I actually forgot to look him up carl gutzel whoever he is uh, he lived between 1811 and 1878 made a uh, quote that uh, steve Wahlberg put in this book and he says oh how powerfully the magnet of illusion attracts now you know that I always try to find a Bible verse that uh, goes in the same line of the quote that uh, the author puts here but with the word illusion it's very difficult because uh, the word illusion is not even in the Bible huh? <laughs> really I checked it out it's not in there delusion and, and, uh, and something is there but uh, illusion is not there but an illusion is like an image and therefore I found a very interesting Bible quote from the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 18 where the Bible says quote what profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it the molten image and the teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols and I think when you think about it a few minutes you will get the connection between the quote from Carl Gutzko and the quote from Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 18. Code Red, Melissa, Sirkam, Nimba, Love Letter, Klez, My Doom. What do all these have in common? They're computer viruses that can turn one's beloved laptop or PC into a terrible malfunctioning machine that becomes good for nothing 
Just as Osama bin Laden became public enemy number one to the United States of America after the September 11, 2001 attacks, even so has the computer virus become public enemy number one to all who sit before a monitor. And in my humble opinion, that's Jörg, my opinion, at the design of computers, especially from Microsoft, the virus problem was built in from the start. It was it opened doors to viruses in there because when you put out viruses in the world you can earn a lot of money with virus protection programs like you can earn lots of money with jabs or vaccinations against other quote-unquote viruses in the world it's nothing new under the sun anyway the author continues to say computer viruses are very sophisticated and destructive software programs designed by evil people who take pleasure in causing chaos and hurting others well you can say those of, of many people in the uh, pharmaceutical industry if you ask me tiny technical terrorists they can slip unnoticed into your computer and ruin everything the most common way for a virus to get inside is via an attachment connected to an apparently friendly email. Enjoy my family photos, the subject line might say. As soon as you click on the attachment to view the pictures, many times it's too late. Once the virus is inside your computer, it quickly multiplies itself like a malicious cancer cell. Data can be removed files can be deleted and everything can get messed up eventually your computer can totally crash and if that happens you may lose everything permanently it might be time for a new computer well when you translate this into our real life then you can say when this virus gets into you, the time may be there for a new body, but this new body you will only get when you accept Jesus Christ and you will see that this body that you are in right now is not worth saving anyway. And that's all I have to say to the today's virus hype that goes all around the world. Think about this a little bit deeper. This chapter, Steve Wahlberg says, is about prophecy and not computers. Nevertheless, we can learn many spiritual lessons from the virus. As we have plainly seen, the Protestant reformers held two core beliefs. First, salvation is through the all-sufficient merits of Jesus Christ alone. And second, Papal Rome is the Antichrist of Scripture. Their prophetic perspective was called historicism. In the language of computers, we might say that historicism was their basic prophetic operating system, much like Windows 2000 and Windows XP are now the main operating systems for most Microsoft-based computers. Even though computer programs and systems become quickly outdated because of upgrades to better versions, it is an amazing fact that historicism remained intact as the primary operating system of most Protestant churches for almost 400 years. I don't get where he gets this 400 years. That's probably because he starts in the beginning of the 16th century, going into the infiltration of futurism in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, we have to understand that historicism is already the Bible interpretation the apostles held. So historicism right. has its roots more than 2,000 years ago. It was always the yeah. biblical view. It is nothing new that popped up 400 years ago. Don't let yeah. anybody teach you that historicism is a new kid on the block. Historicism was always there. Futurism and preterism are the new kids on the block. Right, Tom? Historicism is the biblical teaching. For as long as there's been the Bible, particularly the New Testament, historicism has been the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy, has been the only in school, the only school of Bible prophecy interpretation. Historicism, it, it is consistent with the rule, the hard and fast rule, that prophecy is history foretold. Therefore, historicism 
or the observance of history is the only way to determine that Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. Prophecy avails you very little if you sp speak of it in the future terms. Because not until the Bible, not until the prophecy is fulfilled in history can we be certain of its fulfillment. Anything prior to the historical fulfillment of a Bible prophecy is nothing but speculation, prognostication, okay? It's guesswork at best. You can't take anything for certain when you are prognosticating, as do the futurists who say, the 70th week of Daniel was never fulfilled in history, but it's not going to be fulfilled until sometime in the distant future, particularly just seven years before Christ comes. So everything they teach about that 70th and final week that they say is going to be fulfilled in the future, all they can do is speculate about it. They don't have any hard and fast history. They don't have any hard and fast facts. They can't point to anything to lend authority and respect to their teaching. At best, it is speculation. At best, it is prognostication. At best, it is ridiculous. Okay? But, however, as is, has always been believed by Bible-believing Christians... The 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus. We have the historical account of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th and final week. It's called the New Testament. From Matthew to Revelation consists of abject, first-hand accounts of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, the most infallible record of history that man can read is the New Testament. It uses the very language that Daniel uttered when he uttered the 70 weeks of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. You can read it for yourself and then read the New Testament and see the historical fulfillment of every jot and every tittle of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. There's not one nanosecond of the 70th and final week or any portion of that entire 70-week prophecy that is not fulfilled. 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, by Messiah the Prince. That's what makes him Messiah the Prince. He fulfilled Daniel's 70th week of Daniel. If he did not fulfill it, he's not the Christ. Okay? It's just as simple as that. So you have Daniel, 500 years before the fact, predicting that within 490 years, or rather... Within 483 years, Messiah will come. He will become the Messiah. He will announce himself as did, as is recorded in the scriptures. When Jesus was baptized, the Heavenly Father said, This is my beloved Son. Is that not correct? When he was baptized, when he was anointed by John in the river? Who's to guess that Jesus was not the Messiah? Plainly is recorded. The end of the 483rd year had ended. The beginning of the 484th year, or the very first year of the last seven years of Daniel's prophecy had begun with Jesus' baptism. Look, if, if you say the, the 70th week of Daniel is, is future, you've denied your own Savior. You've can denied I that. You, can I interrupt you for that, a second? Certainly, Kevin? absolutely. Absolutely. It just comes to my mind that the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 9 is the only prophecy that pins down to the day when a That's prophecy right. starts and when a prophecy ends. 
That's because exactly it right. says, with the starting of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. And we all know that there are three decrees out there, and only one decree is the valid one that starts and that fulfills Daniel's 70th week. The point is, the Bible is full of prophecies, even in the Old Testament. And the Bible is, of course, also full of prophecies in the New Testament, especially in the book of Revelation, and not all of those have yet been fulfilled. Some of them are still future. But there is not one, to my knowledge at least, maybe anybody can correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken, there is not one Bible prophecy where God puts the finger on the exact day when it starts and the exact day when it ends. Yeah. The exact day when it starts is the decree of Artaxerxes, is the anointing of Jesus Christ in the River Jordan at the age of 30, and the beginning of the 70th week after 483 years is the three and a half years after that when Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood for all of mankind and is three and a half years after that when the 70th week was finished with the stoning of Stephen and the gospel went from the Jews to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, there's not one other prophecy in all of the Bible that says the exact date when things are going to happen. Am I correct? That's there, right. Tom? That's right. That's exactly right. There's no other prophecy in the Bible that we can be so certain of its exact, precise fulfillment, and not only its precise fulfillment, but its timeliness. Now, let me warn the listeners. There have been people who have made their careers out of confusing the days that elapsed from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and to Messiah the Prince. And I'll name you one of them, Sir Robert Anderson. He was a member of Scotland Yard, very celebrated policeman in England, was supposed to be a Bible prophecy expert. And he, of course... When he got done counting the days from the going forth of this command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince, he got to Messiah the Prince and the prophecy ended. The days were over, which allows for a 2,000-year gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. Everybody that propounds this cockamamie futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, all of Every, eventually lords it over uh, uh, on this, this so-called Sir Robert Anderson. He's the great authority behind futurism. He's the one that counted the days. I mean, Lord, if you can count the days between that command and, and, and uh, the 69th week of Daniel, you really, you really got it made. You really are a diviner, aren't you? I mean, he'd have to go to NASA to confirm how many days had transpired. But everybody believes this cockamamie nonsense. They believe the story of Sir Robert Anderson and how he divined what day it is, what time it was, how many days had elapsed since the going forth of the command until Messiah the Prince, that everybody has forgotten to read the New Testament and see for themselves with their own eyes the historical account line by line, precept by precept, of the Messiah's complete and perfect fulfillment of that 70th and final week. And no one has stopped to realize that if you detach that 70th week from the 69th week, you have denied that Christ has come in the flesh. You see, so Sir Robert Anderson is all important to the Roman Catholic Church, isn't it? They wanted, the Roman Catholic Church wants to deny that Messiah has come in the flesh. Oh yeah, I know they preach Jesus. Have you ever heard about their Jesus? Well, it's recorded in the Bible that he died on the cross, but in order to benefit from that death on the cross, you have to do it over and over and over and over and over all your life in the Roman Catholic Church in the Mass. 
Is that what the Bible says? No, they preach to you another Jesus, a fictitious Jesus, a lying wonder they call Jesus, which has nothing to do with Messiah the Prince. Messiah the Prince fulfilled the historical 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. That was Jesus' ministry. And if the 70th week of Daniel is future, like like. Sir Robert Anderson would have you believe, then you have denied that Jesus was the Christ. You have denied that Messiah has come in the flesh. And the Bible plainly tells you that is the spirit of Antichrist. Do you know who authored this Antichrist teaching? The papacy. That's why the Bible calls it the spirit of Antichrist. Futurism is exposed in the Bible as the spirit of Antichrist. That's what futurism is called in the Bible, the spirit of Antichrist. If you believe in futurism, you believe Antichrist. You call Jesus a liar. When Jesus was asked by his, one of his disciples, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus, in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, declared himself to be the Messiah, the Prince, when he responded and said, no, not seven times, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times shall you forgive your brother. And that's what Jesus was doing. The 70 times, seventh time that he had forgiven his brethren, the Jews. And that was to be the end of it. Jesus was literally calling himself the 70th week of Daniel. I say not unto you seven times, but 70 times seven times. These cockamamie people like Sir Robert Anderson would have you believe Jesus never dis described himself as the Messiah. Never once, they say, did Jesus call himself the Messiah. Why would they say such a stupid, blasphemous thing like that? Because they don't believe Jesus was the Messiah either. Because the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. And that's exactly what the Jews believe, too. Their Messiah has not yet come. What Messiah, pray tell, do you think the Jews are waiting on? Certainly not the Messiah that gave himself a ransom for many 2,000 years ago in the midst of the 70th and final week. No, they don't accept that Messiah. They never have. They want their own Messiah. And they're going to get one. He's going to come in his own name. Not the one the Father gave him. He's going to come in his own name. And him they will receive starting to make sense now? You still believe those futurist liars? Steve Wolberg's telling you the truth. He might be a Seventh-day Adventist, but I'll tell you something else. He's also a Jew, and he's also a Bible reader, and he's telling you the truth. The 70th week of Daniel is over, or Jesus was not the Christ. It's just that simple, people. If the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, Messiah has not yet come, and you have denied your own salvation. You have blasphemed your own Savior. It's just that simple. Look, there is no better, more perfect, more divinely written historical account of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy than is the New Testament. And that was written 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, the prophecy was fulfilled. You can't get it wrong. Oh, yes, you can get it wrong if you listen to Sir Robert Anderson. If you listen to your futurist deceivers behind the pulpits of all your churches, you will be deceived just like I was. Oh, yes, they preach Jesus and him crucified, and they turn right around on the other side of their mouth and say the 70th week of Daniel's yet future. You never heard such confusion and contradiction in your life with such grave consequences. Did you hear what Steve Wolberg said at the very beginning of this chapter? 
there were two planks to biblical Christianity. The plank number one is that Jesus and Jesus alone is the propitiation for the sin of man. The redemption of man is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And the second part is the papacy is the Antichrist. And what have I been telling you ever since you first heard my name? There are two planks to biblical Christianity, not just one. There are two planks to biblical Christianity, the first being Jesus is the Christ. And the second one is the papacy is the Antichrist. And we should add a third one in this day and age, we should say, and the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Messiah the Prince 2,000 years ago. And if you don't believe that, you've defied your own salvation. You've denied that Christ has come in the flesh. You can't know whether you're worshiping Jesus or Antichrist. You've mixed the holy with the profane. You've mixed the truth with a lie. That's what your pastor, and I don't care what church you go to in this world, that's what your pastor teaches you to believe. Now, people are always writing me, Tom, what church would you recommend? Where can I go to, to find a historicist church? I can't make a recommendation. I don't know of any pure historicist churches. There are no biblical churches anymore. They're all contaminated with some form or other of futurism. And they're all deceived, and they can only deceive you. Sure, you can go and have fellowship until you find out they all deny Christ with their mouth. Then what fellowship do you have? Look, you're going to have to learn to worship Christ alone. And, and, and don't listen to them say, Oh, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together, as such be the manner of some. Oh, I've heard that a million times. But the rebuttal is scripture. It says, how can two walk together unless they agree? I believe Messiah came in the flesh 2,000 years ago at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. That in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblation to cease by giving up his own life and become the propitiation for sin, redeeming man once and for all to God. The sin issue is over. The curse of Adam is over. The curse of the Garden of Eden is over. The Lamb's blood has been shed. Redemption is sure. It's already a done deal. Why do we pray for that which we already have? And yet, they'll tell you, the 70th week of Daniel is not even begun yet. It won't be for another however long. Dreamers, diabolical dreamers, they believe in smooth saying soothsayers. They take nothing for sure because they have nothing for sure. But you, if you read your New Testament, you find the itemized, detailed, perfect, complete record, historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, you do not look for a future fulfillment. You warn against a future fulfillment, or you help to deceive God's people. You're no better than the pastor behind the pulpit, the hireling who's only in it for the money. I could go on all day. I could go on all night. I could go on for a week, Yerk. I've been over this so many times. People ought to know it by heart. I think some people are getting bored with it. But do they believe it? It's undeniable. And Steve Wolberg knows it. A magnificent book that he wrote. Yes, he might be a Seventh-day Adventist. Yes, he might be a Jew. But he reads his Bible, and he understands history. I might be able to find an error somewhere in his book, but would that disqualify 
all the truth he tells in his book, which I have found independently of Stephen Wolberg? He's telling the truth. I bear witness to the truth. I can't st- I can't remain silent about this truth. And there's only one thing you can conclude. You can't get this truth in the churches. Why? Because they all believe in futurism. They all teach futurism. They all deny that Christ has come in the flesh. They are all of the spirit of Antichrist. And how do I know? Not just the Bible says so, but we know the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, is the author of futurism. It had never been known in the world, never discussed among God's people until it was known first in the Roman Catholic Church. It's the only way the papacy could deceive people within the Roman Catholic Church. When the Protestants throughout history incessantly named the papacy as the Antichrist, there had to be an answer. The Roman Catholic Church had to find an answer. And they simply said, the Antichrist cannot be the Pope because it doesn't happen till the end of time. What a cockamamie load of who he is that. Do you think it ever changed the mind of a Bible-believing Christian? No, but it sure deceived a lot of Roman Catholics who would have become, would have come out of the Roman Catholic Church and joined the protest against the papacy. Look, two planks of Protestantism. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. Steve Wolberg, completely independently of me or anybody else, has discovered the same thing. And he's absolutely correct. Undeniably. That's the fellowship that I have with Steve Wolberg, and I've never seen his face. I wouldn't know him if I met him on the street. But I have communion with him. That's how it is in the body of Christ. It's an invisible body. It has an invisible head. But it's soon to be manifest in the world. As soon as the deceiver has run his deceptions to the full. God has granted Satan the freedom to deceive until his time is full. Then I'll get to meet Steve Wolberg face to face and throw my arm around his neck and call him Brother Steve. Seventh-day Adventist or not. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I have to see where I have to pick up again. Yeah, the last 400 years, right? <laughs> that was an extensive comment on that, but I think it was necessary. And I'm, I'm glad I brought this little uh, thing up. I, I tried to use that as a title of the video, that the 70th week of Daniel uh, is the only prophecy where God tells the exact date. And that is in um, contradiction to all the date setters out there who try to set a date for Jesus' second coming or to set a date for when the mark of the beast will be put on all the Christian world where probably the mark of the beast already is hundreds of years already there. That is only because many people misunderstand the mark of the beast. But, or, or try to put any other date on any other prophecy that has not been fulfilled yet. People try to make themselves God. God said with the 70th week of Daniel exactly when the uh, decree of Artaxerxes was made. From that day on, 483 years, and you will see the prince being anointed in the River Jordan. And that's exactly what happened to the day. God is that exact. And man is that that's right. wrong. That's right. Have you heard the expression, I'd rather fight 
then switch? That's how most Protestants felt about historicism from the 1500s all the way down to the early 20th century. Okay, there you go. That's what explains his 400-year statement. Yeah, he skips about 100 okay. years. Yeah, yeah I, uh, that's no big sin. That's no big crime. Uh, Steve Wolberg just needs to know that uh, it, the Jesuits uh, infiltrated the, the uh, Protestant seminaries in England at the early part of the 1800s. I come to that in a later okay. part, Tom. Yeah, okay. I, I, I won't I'm belabor a... it then. No, no, you, you can come, come then because I speak of the Emancipation Act and the Oxford Movement. Yeah, very well. And those are the moments. Anyway, uh, but in our 21st century, the author continues to say, historicism has faded and futurism is in as the majority report. What happened? How did the seismic shift take place? The story is both fascinating as is it tragic. Here are the highlights. We have already seen that at the Council of Trent, the Roman Church reacted against the, Reform against the Reformation by commissioning members of the Jesuit order to counteract historicism. And I prepared two pictures of the Council of Trent that I want to share with you. There's first of all this picture that is probably someone most people never have seen. When you read the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy, it has a uh, chapter where it goes also into the Council of Trent. And there is a sketch that Tupper Saucy made in black and white in the book where he sketches this picture. This picture actually shows uh, Pope Paul III, I think he is the one here with the red hat, <laughs> or maybe the one with the black hat, I don't know, I never met him on the way to the council, led by an quote-unquote angel, which you can see, of course, here with the uh, little wings here, is kind of Hermes. Hermes is Mercury, is Satan. <laughs> it's just another name for him. That angel leading to the council of Trent. It's a, it, it took hours and days even to search the whole internet to find a picture that uh, is the sketch that F. Tapper Saucy did. So this is Paul III, that is the Antichrist who ordained the Jesuits in 1540, uh, in, in 1540 on the way to the Council of Trent that started in 1545. And this painting is by Sebastiano Ricci. Yeah? And there is another picture of the Council of Trent that I want to show for the moment when we are reading about this. And that puts it a little bit together what the Council of Trent is all about. It is the Council of the Counter-Reformation. That is actually what Steve Wahlberg says here too. Yeah? We have already seen that the Council of Trent, the Roman Church, reacted against the Reformation by commissioning members of the Jesuit order to counteract historicism. Counteract, counteract, to go against that is what the Council of Trent was all about. It was a meeting where they assembled to go against the teaching of historicism, of biblical teaching, because the Roman Catholic Church forbids to read the Bible. The Roman Catholic right. Church forbids to understand the Bible. Right. How can a church that forbids to read the Bible call itself Christian for crying out loud? That's right, that's right. In a short time, Alcazar and Ribera put forth their anti-protestant counter theories. It's this, it's only theories. It is like the evolution theory. It is a theory. It can't be proven. It won't hold up. It won't hold up against the light of scripture. It won't hold up against the light of truth. In this chapter yeah, that we call uh, the path of the virus, in this chapter the inroads of Ribera's influence into Protestantism will be traced because Although Alcazar's preterism is now making renewed progress into churches, Ribera's teaching is overwhelmingly dominant. Now you're going to probably ask yourself, why is Alcazar's preterism making renewed progress into the churches? 
You well, tell Tom, them, Tom spoke about that already, I think, in the last uh, broadcast. And he maybe will speak about it this time again, or I can uh, just give you the notion that there are many people who are disappointed that futurism hasn't come to a fulfillment. And therefore, right. they seek the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the past. That will let them rest and sleep again at night when they have oh. that understanding that everything is already fulfilled in the past. Even in 70 AD, which is impossible because in 70 AD, with the destruction of Jerusalem, there couldn't all the prophecies of the book of Revelation have been fulfilled because the book of Revelation was only written in 95-96 AD. Impossible. Mm -hmm. But these people take every little straw as their help. But okay. you know, Can I take a stab at it? Yeah, but you know what a straw has as a big disadvantage? It breaks very easily. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Tom. Too flimsy, those straws. Yeah, those flimsy. Cotton yeah. straws are just too flimsy. Look, look. Everybody was jubilant. When in 1948, Israel was established as a nation in the world, the futurists were just euphoric. They said it was Bible prophecy being fulfilled right before their eyes. They got the whole futurist Christian world stirred up, ready for the rapture at any time. Israel was finally a nation. You know what that meant? That it could be just days before a temple was built and the Jews could resume animal sacrifices. And then, of course, the Antichrist, who they perceive as the Antichrist, is going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease on Temple Mount. And then everybody will know who the Antichrist is. And then, of course, before that happens, we're all going to be raptured out. I mean, can you understand why they were so jubilant when Israel became a nation in a day in 1948? Let me tell you something, that was all orchestrated. The whole thing to get the whole futurist world on their side. And they're still on their side, except a few of them are beginning to comprehend. That was way back in 1948. Here it is, 2021, and there's still no temple, still no sacrifices being made on Temple Mount. The 70th week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled. How long are we going to have to wait? First 40 years passed, now 70 years have passed. What are we waiting for? They're beginning to think futurism is wrong. They're getting tired of waiting. God just keeps throwing the monkey wrench into the works on Temple Mount, raising up the Palestinians, raising up the Muslims, raising up... Katusha rockets and everything else to slow down this futurist delusion that all of his people believe in. Maybe it's 483 years, Tom. Maybe. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I, I don't Look, know. I, I will not live to see that. <laughs> there, there's, there's, uh, there's no telling what the futurists believe. I mean, they are confounded of face. They are, they are ashamed of themselves, the futurists. They won't admit it publicly, of course. They're too proud of their futurist delusion to admit that it's all wrong. All the millions and millions and millions of books, movies, videos, all the wealth that they've generated with the greatest delusion since the Garden of Eden. They have to... They, you know what the truth is? It was all gotten ill-gotten gain. It all ought to be restored to those who spent the money for all those lies. I want my money back, Tom. I want my money back from all the futurist lies I've been told. From the very first one, it was called a thief in the night. They let school out early so us kids could go to the, to the local theater to witness that lying wonder called a thief in the night. And we all came out of that thing crying for fear we'd be left behind. And it wasn't 20, 30, 40 years later, the whole Left Behind series of videos and books came out and people spent their hard-earned money. Millions and millions, if not 
billions of dollars have been spent on the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. I want my money back. Okay? But they're not going to give your money back. You want to believe in lies? You want to slather them down with millions and billions of dollars? Go right ahead. Buy the next one. That's right. We'll wait till the next futurist load of crap comes down the pipe, and we'll gobble it all up like greedy geezers. Look, it's time for reality to sink in. It's been too long since 1948. Futurism is an obvious dead anchor. Okay? It's obviously not the truth. Only the last weird holdouts are still holding out for a futurist fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. So they think, well, what other delusion can we, li- can we believe in? It's preterism. Oh, no, they're not going to return to historicism. They've never heard of it, number one. They've never heard of historicism. Just like in 1800, before futurism was ever heard in the Protestant and evangelical churches, the only thing they'd ever heard of was historicism. Now today, no one has ever heard of historicism. It's all futurism and preterism. You got two choices, and they're both wrong. So well, I'm here to make historicism uh, the only choice that makes sense. It's, it's, the like only going to choice the, it's like going to the elections in the United States and choosing between Republicans and Democrats. Every choice you make is wrong. <laughs> That's right. Heads I win, tails you lose. Yeah. You pick a Democrat, it's heads I win. You pick a Republican, it's tails you lose. When will the American people wake up? Why are God's people so ignorant? You keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Do you know what uh, Einstein called it to uh, do the same thing over and over again and expecting uh, another outcome? Insanity. (laughs) And that's what futurism is. It's insane. That's absolutely correct. There's no way to get it right. Except that if you just quit playing the game. Now, right now, the choices are historic, or rather futurism and preterism. In other words, you can't get it right. So what's my solution? Give you the only solution that's correct. Historicism. Well, let's call that our biblical Hegelian dialectic. You have the thesis, futurism, antithesis, preterism, come to the synthesis, historicism. Yeah, well, I would never (laughs) call the truth any kind of synthesis between error. No, I'm just saying that I'm just saying that a little bit as a joke because I wouldn't use Hegelian dialectic with the with the words of the Bible, Tom, but it's 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 kind of the same thing, you know. Use the one thing, smash it against the other and come out with a solution that is the solution you always wanted. What do we always want? We want the people to throw away their futurist teaching. We want the people to throw away their preterist teaching and come to the only teaching that is biblically holding up, and that is historicism. That's correct. That's correct. I just chose a little bit other words to let it sound a little (laughs) bit funny, you know, to make a little joke about it. But this is a a serious subject, and we are so serious all the time, so I thought a little laughter was uh, was in place to to go there. But uh, it's the most serious subject known to man. Absolutely. Because if, if you believe in a system of Bible prophecy interpretation that excludes you from the body of Christ, you're lost. And it's a very, very important subject to talk about. And most Christians, I mean, I can't go so far as to say all, because I'm not one of them, and you're not one of them. Steve Wahlberg's not one of them. But nearly all of Christianity today, if held responsible for what they believe, if held responsible for what they say with their mouths, They've excluded themselves from salvation. They've denied the blood of Christ when they say the 70th week of Daniel is future. 
And look, their futurist scheme is just, God just keeps throwing the monkey wrenches in. It doesn't look like God is ever going to let them fulfill their futurist delusion and have any confidence whatsoever in their futurist delusion, which I think is only fair of, of, a, of a sincere God, a loving God. You know, some people ask me, how long is God going to allow this futurist delusion to continue? Is he going to let it continue? Well, so far, it looks like he's not going to let it continue. He keeps using the Muslims. He keeps using, you know, Baghdad. He keeps using Iran. He keeps using all these other things to delay. No, there's no way they can convincingly fulfill their desired 70th week of Daniel as long as there's, if they can't pull it off convincingly. And as long as there's some interference over there, like Palestinians or, or Muslims or Iranians or, 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 or Saddam Hussein or weapons of mass destruction, they've got a risk that it will all fall on its face and they'll all be found out for the liars that they are. Yeah, what God actually does in this case, Tom, is he ridicules the teaching of That's futurism. What he's doing. Because he's making they, a laughing stock of futurism. He's making a laughing stock out of them because they cannot come to a fulfillment of their false prophecy. So he That's shows right. them how ridiculed they, ridiculous they are. And right. some of these people wake up, and I hope, Tom, those people wake up to your and my YouTube channel and yeah. to the explosion of futurism as a diabolical mm -hmm. lie and ridiculous teaching that it is. They ought to all have a red face. They ought to all be ashamed to show themselves in public for the crap that they believed. Look, 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 please, I'm one of them. I, for 50 years of my life, I believed this futurist load of crap. So, just, so don't get start feeling like I'm looking down my long nose at everybody else. I, I, I went through this deception all by my, all with my whole family. I didn't know anything about historicism. I'd never heard the term. All I knew was what everybody else knew, futurism. But I also am here to tell you it is a lie straight from the pit. It should not be taken seriously by anybody. It should be condemned by everybody. It is obviously wrong. And now I believe and I can see with my own eyes how God keeps throwing monkey wrenches into their futurist fulfillment. He's not going to allow it to happen. He's, he's buying time for his people to come to the truth. He's postponing, delaying, throwing monkey wrenches into the works so that they cannot build a temple in Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So his Jewish brethren who he bled and died for, are not permitted to make animal sacrifices again to eat and drink damnation of themselves. He's a merciful God. He loves those that he bled and died to redeem. Why would he allow them to build a temple if their heart is set on making animal sacrifices again? You know, there's no other perfect way. There's no more perfect way in this world for a Jew to deny Christ his Savior but to make an animal sacrifice. You know why the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom when Jesus cried, let his finish, and he gave up the ghost. The rocks were rent, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. That's so they could not make any more sacrifices. They could not put any more blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. As a matter of fact, the Ark of the Covenant was not even seen in the temple for at least 500 years before that day. The blood of lambs and goats cannot take away sin. Why, oh, why would the Christian world be wanting the Jews to build a temple and make animal sacrifices? Where is the sanity?
We all say we're saved. We all say we're child, children of the living God. We all say we read our Bible. We go to church every Sunday, and we study the Scriptures and don't learn a dang thing. Why? Because you got a soothsayer behind the pulpit. He won't make you think. He wants you to just conform to the futurist norm that has deceived the whole world. Because he wants to get paid. He wants the pews full of tithe-paying dupes so he can drive a Mercedes. He can build a great, big, fancy mega church, get his name and lights all over, fly his own private jet to prophecy conferences all over the world so he can spew his futurist delusion everywhere he goes. Because it's popular. It makes people feel good. We're going to be raptured out. We're going to be raptured out. What a, what a lie. What, what a deception. We ought to all be ashamed. We ought to all be on our faces before the Lord in repentant shame. I'm including myself. I'm no better than anybody listening to me. I've committed all the same sin. This isn't about me. It's about all of us. How long are we going to harbor a phony love for a phony lie? Look, I want Jesus to come. I want him to take us away. But when he comes, I don't want him to find me teaching lies to his people. And that's why I preach futurism, or rather historicism. And I expose futurism as the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden with the greatest of consequences, negative consequences, damnable consequences for God's people. The Jesuits have deceived us all. The Jesuits have occupied the pulpits of the Protestant and Evangelical churches for nigh unto 200 years in this country. They've had occupied the lying pulpit for so long we've never heard the truth. And the Bible even confirms this. It says the, Jesu or the, the Gentiles will say our fathers have never told us anything but lies. I wish I could have book, chapter, and verse for that one, but you can look it up yourself. It says so right in the Scripture. The Gentiles will say our, for our fathers have never taught us anything but lies. Prophecy fulfilled. You can see it in history, vividly recorded in every church program. Futurism, morning, noon, and night, lie upon lie, false hope upon false hope, deceiving and being deceived. We've never been told the truth. Not that wasn't watered down with all kinds of lies. Prophecy fulfilled right before your eyes. Seen in history. That's how you know prophecy is being fulfilled. You can see its fulfillment in history. The Bible prophesies that the Gentiles will say our fathers have taught us nothing but lies. Now you know why. Another prophecy fulfilled in the Bible. That's how we know it's God's word. Prophecy is history foretold. When you see its fulfillment in history, you cannot deny it. What are we going to do? Look, the Jews were finally convinced. The Sanhedrin was finally convinced by the unimpeachable impeachable arguments of Stephen on that last day of the 490th year of Daniel's prophecy.
the last day of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy, Stephen the prophet stood before the Sanhedrin and convinced them beyond any doubt that Jesus was Messiah the Prince and that they wickedly slew their own Messiah. And he convinced them so thoroughly that all they could do was rent their clothes. And you would think, being so utterly, unimpeachably convinced that they had slain their own Messiah, that they would have gotten down on their faces on the steps of the Sanhedrin in their ripped clothes and repented in sackcloth and ashes and tears. Stephen was right, and they knew it. But instead of repenting, they retrenched themselves and they stoned Stephen to shut him up. That's what's going to happen today. Futurism is such a laughable delusion that no one's going to be so humble as to admit such a gross mistake. And instead of getting down on their faces to repent of their futurism, they're going to stone the messenger. That's what's going to happen. Well, let the stoning begin. The President DeJoya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, both, both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint Agenda 21 for envir Global Environmental Action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, for the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this House. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. Well, let me say this. If the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ in his group. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.